They said, well, it has to be all three of you guys or it's nobody. And um, so we, you know, we, you know, we looked at each other. We was like, well, guess there's nobody. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're looking at the best feature length documentaries about real life crimes. No multi-part series. And there will be spoilers. He, he, he stole that part of them. And they're all struggling to get it back. Number 10, Operation Varsity Blues, The College Admission Scandal. This documentary tells a tale of corruption and fraud in American education. Wealthy parents were charged with bribing universities to accept their children. Among the 50 charged were famous actors like Felicity Huffman and Lori Loughlin. At the heart of the scam were former coach William Rick Singer and John Vandemore. If you want, I can provide John Vandemore with a check. I can send him your $500,000 to secure a spot for one of your girls. Director Chris Smith used wiretap transcripts and blogs to piece together the story, along with reenactments. Not gonna tell the IRS that, you know, that Mark took the test for Isabel or the Gordy. <clears throat> right, right, yeah. Or the Gordy, you know, uh, we paid Gordy to help get into Georgetown, right? Smith also got the participation of Singer's former business associate to find out information on the coach. All in all, this documentary is eye-opening in exposing the ways the wealthy game the system. We're here today to announce charges in the largest college admissions scam ever prosecuted by the Department of Justice. Number nine, Tales of the Grim Sleeper. Everyone knew Lonnie. He was a good neighbor, someone to turn to for help. Documentaries about serial killers are not unusual, but director Nick Broomfield's film about the murderer called The Grim Sleeper also highlights perceived indifference by the police in capturing the killer. Relating the story of Lonnie Franklin Jr., eventually charged in 2010 with murdering 10 young black women, it includes activists who claimed police weren't motivated because many of the victims were poor drug users or sex workers. 11 or 12 women were already killed before they even announced anything. And when we went and said we were concerned about it, they said, well, why are you concerned about it? Franklin took a 14-year hiatus from killing, earning him the nickname Grim Sleeper when he resumed. And he thought it was fun. He laughed, gave me that little funny grin, or he winked that eye at me. Eventually, he was arrested on a felony charge unrelated to his murders. But that gave the department a DNA sample, which finally led to his arrest. And uh, he was eating pizza at a pizza parlor. And then they uh, got the DNA from an empty cup that he was drinking out of, and bam. Broomfield's film reveals this chilling but all too familiar tale of murder, systemic indifference, and racial bigotry. Number eight, The Invisible War. This award-winning film is another blood-curdling expose on institutional indifference. I was always taught that it's every citizen's duty to join the military. If you can, you should. And so I, I wanted to go ahead and join and start a career. This time, it concerns the most heinous of crimes committed by people sworn to protect and defend. Utilizing countless interviews by veterans, director Kirby Dick investigates endemic sexual assault in the military. So the minute a female shows up at my work, she's immediately pounced on. All of the new females get talked about. The victims include soldiers assaulted by their own servicemen, only to be disbelieved and even retaliated against. When we went to one of the higher ups the chain of command, they were all like his his drinking buddy, and they, they told me just because I didn't like somebody, they weren't gonna switch me away from this guy. Due to military hierarchy, many have even had to report their assault to their own attackers. As a result, few assailants are prosecuted and convicted. Invisible War not only sheds light on toxic aspects of military culture, but also on flaws in our own culture. You can't ask women to serve and then say, oh, by the way, if you get in one of these horrendous situations, we won't be there to back you up or to help you. Number seven, Athlete A. Systemic abuse and cover-ups are not just confined to the military. This documentary follows the crimes of Larry Nasser, a doctor who sexually assaulted hundreds of women, many of them young female gymnasts. I was like, wait a minute. This doctor used to do very similar things to me. Starting in 2015, Maggie Nichols, Rachel Denhollander, and Jessica Howard, among other gymnasts, accused Nasser of mistreatment. Now we're, now we're talking three people, and these women didn't know each other. How many more could there be? It turned out that allegations of carnal assault went back years, covered up by Steve Penny, the USA Gymnastics CEO. Penny was eventually charged with evidence tampering, though the charges were later dismissed. 
Directors Bonnie Cohen and John Shank follow reporters from the Indianapolis Star as they investigate the case against Nasser. I know that means that if the DA picks it up, I'll be testifying with great detail in open court in front of him, knowing that we both have the same memories. And I hate that idea. I hate it. But if I don't, he can continue. By the time Nasser was convicted, more than 260 victims had accused Nasser of gross mistreatment. When you take the ability to love and express love from somebody and take it away or damage it, it profoundly affects their psyche. Number six, Amanda Knox. Amanda Knox. It was a case that had captivated the whole world. Amanda Knox, an American exchange student living in Italy, was convicted twice of murdering her roommate. Either I'm a psychopath in sheep's clothing, or I am you. In this documentary, directors Rod Blackhurst and Brian McGinn allow Knox to tell her own side of the story. The knife, I could not explain. There was no reason for my DNA to have been on a handle and Meredith's DNA to have been on the blade. It was impossible. Despite evidence suggesting another perpetrator, the Italian police investigated Knox and her then-boyfriend for their unusual behaviors. Tabloids followed suit, demonizing Knox as a femme fatale obsessed with sex and the occult. And as it turned out, Chief Prosecutor Giuliano Mignini had a history of baseless and sexist theorizing, as well as abuses of power. In the end, Knox spent four years in Italian prison before she was finally acquitted in 2015. But you're trying to find the answer in my eyes when the answer's right over there. You're looking at me, why? Number five, the inventor, out for blood in Silicon Valley. Take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step, right? And this is, this is the first step. This film follows infamous entrepreneur Elizabeth Holmes and her company Theranos, which promised to diagnose 200 diseases with just a few drops of blood. Hailed as a wunderkind, Holmes managed to convince investors in the value of Theranos' Edison machine. There was one small problem. Edison did not work. Pieces of the device would literally fall off in the middle of testing, centrifuges exploding inside of it and, <laughs> and things like that. Undeterred, Holmes and her team ignored bad news on the machine's efficacy. They strictly told us to stay at your desk. They didn't want any of us down there because they were scared if the inspectors saw what was going on, that could have huge consequences. Director Alex Gibney investigates Holmes' motives. Was she an arrogant idealist or a cynical fraud? Either way, Holmes's hubris left a trail of victims and at least one self-inflicted death in her wake. Number four, mommy dead and dearest. There are some crimes that are truly so bizarre they are stranger than fiction. I'm always in. You're the reason I was born to be your mama. The murder of Dee Dee Blanchard by her daughter, Gypsy Rose Blanchard, was the result of some truly horrific abuse. Blanchard convinced people that her daughter was ill, when in fact, Gypsy Rose was in perfect health. And her goal is some kind of emotional gratification, looking for sympathy, attention, care. Blanchard went so far as to insert a feeding tube into her daughter and have her use an unnecessary wheelchair. Desperate to escape, Gypsy Rose and her then-boyfriend carried out the murder. Dee Dee Blanchard was so unstable that her own relatives were not at all sad to see her go. Yeah, what you want me to do with the ashes? Everybody said, oh, I don't want her. I don't Garnish want her. Flushing. Gypsy Rose is now out on parole, no doubt scarred by her ordeal. I'm sorry for it. I feel bad for it. Um, it just feels good to be honest. Number three, The Imposter. Another bizarre true crime is the subject of this lauded 2012 documentary. So, Tony me I had to walk home. And that's, what's the day? The last time we heard from him. Nicholas Patrick Barkley, a teenager from Texas, disappeared in 1994, but apparently reappeared three years later in Spain. Was it him? I said, yeah, he said, I love you. Oh, and then she started crying on the phone. Well, you start crying and you tell him we're gonna come get you and bring you home. But as it turns out, the man was an imposter, French impersonator Frederic Bourdin. I was thinking to myself that Nicolas Barclay could come back at his house any day. That was my first worry. I was really worried about that. He altered himself to look like Nicholas, fooling even Barclay's own mother. Bourdin was eventually arrested thanks to the work of investigators, but that is not the end. 
And as I looked at the picture, I noticed that the boy had blue-gray looking eyes, and this man had brown eyes. Bourdain alleged that the family killed Nicholas. Their acceptance of Bourdain was an attempt to cover up their crime. Director Bart Layton shows all the sides of the story and leaves us with the question, was this family truly the victims of an unrepentant con man, or is there something more sinister at work? I saw them as a very questionable family. There'd be no reason for them to accept a stranger into their lives um, unless there was something to hide. Number two, The Thin Blue Line. This is the film that changed the way documentaries were made forever. I get up, I go to work on Saturday. You know, why did I meet this kid? I don't know. Why did I run out of gas at that time? I don't know. Errol Morris's film follows the case of Randall Dale Adams, accused of shooting Dallas police officer Robert W. Wood in 1976. Although all the evidence pointed to 16-year-old David Harris, Adams was the one convicted and sentenced to death. Morris's use of reenactments and a cinematic style deviated from the standard verite style of documentaries. And that's the man, and she waved her finger right toward Randall Adams. She's the one that got him convicted. As a result, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences refused to consider it for best documentary. Morris's film also managed to secure a confession from Harris himself via voiceover. If you could say why there's a reason that Randall Adams is in jail, it might be because of that he didn't have no place for uh, somebody to stay that helped him that night. Finally, Adams was released after 12 years in prison. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, the Central Park Five. Most people have heard of the infamous 1989 case of five black and Latino teenagers wrongly accused of gang assault. Browbeaten into making false confessions, the teens were convicted. Confessions will trump DNA. Confessions will change witnesses' testimony. Confessions are irresistibly persuasive and almost the effects can't be reversed. The real criminal, Matias Reyes, finally confessed to the assault, supported by DNA evidence. By then, however, the five teens had largely served their sentences, between seven and 13 years. And if you watch the videotaped confessions, it turns out they actually don't know where the crime took place, they don't know when it took place, and they don't know how it took place. The Central Park Five exposes the racial and class divides that led to this miscarriage of justice. Not only that, it also tells this grisly history through the point of view of the five teens themselves. When I was released, uh, best feeling in the world, you know, I said, wow, you know, I, I, I got a fresh start. I can try to pick up, put my life back together. Yeah, he came home uh, and, and, and I was happy he's home and all that. The now exonerated men filed a lawsuit against the city of New York, which eventually agreed to a settlement after several years' resistance. Which true crime documentary was truly better than any fiction? Let us know in the comments down below. She was punished enough to where they should let her go free.